So we're going to spend some time now going over the topic of science. What is science? How does science work? So this is uh, critically important, of course, because everything that we're learning, everything we know about in this world, on this earth, is through the process of science. As a healthcare worker, as a nurse, whatever, you're constantly tapping into the processes and principles of science to do your work. So imagine a patient comes into the emergency room and you're working there. Uh, they're complaining about symptoms they have. Uh, they don't feel well, whatever. The first thing you're probably going to do that you're trained to do is take down some notes, take down some observations of what's going on. This is what scientists do. We fundamentally observe the natural world and describe patterns, describe what we see. Then as this nurse, you might then want to uh, figure out what's wrong with the patient. And of course, you need to consult with a physician or a doctor. But when you do this, then you're coming up with hypotheses. You're coming up with answers or explanations for what's wrong. Then you need to do some tests. You need to see whether your hypotheses are correct or a particular hypothesis is correct. So you need to do some tests or experiments. And for that, a physician would probably order some tests, maybe a blood test, a urine test, an EKG, MRI, all kinds of different tests to do. Uh, once you get back the results of those tests, then you can evaluate whether uh, those results are consistent with your hypothesis of what you think is wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, most of you want to work in the healthcare field, and I'm just trying to make the case right at the outset that everything you do day after day is uh, based in science. And even in our everyday lives, it's helpful to understand the process of science and apply the principles of science to uh, discover and understand uh, the world around you. So this slide is about reasoning. There are two philosophical ways of reasoning. There is deductive reasoning and there's inductive reasoning. So we're going to go through this a little bit. Deductive reasoning starts with a general principle or explanation and then uses that general principle or explanation to explain specific observations. So it's going from the general to the specific. And I'll give you an example in just a, a minute, the next slide. Inductive reasoning goes the opposite direction. It begins with specific observations and those specific observations may, might lead to a general principle, a general idea. So it's going the other way. And we do both things in science uh, to make sense of our natural world. What kind of reasoning you're doing or need to do, more or less depends on what kind of question you are investigating. So we're going to start here with deductive reasoning. So I think a really helpful way to think about deductive reasoning or to use deductive reasoning is to use the if and then logic statement. The if statement includes the hypothesis or general principle that you're beginning with, perhaps that you want to test. The and statement describes the experiment the procedure that you're going to do. And the then statement identifies the expected outcome or result of your experiment when you carry it out. And the then statement is your prediction. A prediction is an expected outcome. So here's the logic. Here's the idea. It's saying if my hypothesis or general statement is in fact true and I do this, 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 and this, you know, I do this experiment, I do this procedure, follow this process, then it's logical that I'm going to get this outcome, this specific result. That's deductive logic. So in the case of the traffic light uh, example here out of your textbook, uh, 
if traffic lights are timed, if that's true, and I drive at a speed consistent with the timing, matched with the timing, then I will expect that each light will turn green as I approach it. It's a logical expected outcome. That's deductive logic. You might try to think of some other examples just in your everyday life. If X is true and I investigate or do an experiment like this, then this is the result I would expect to get. So now let's take a look at inductive reasoning. Remember what I said two slides ago, that inductive reasoning logically works in the opposite direction from deductive reasoning. So we begin by recording observations. And then, based on those observations, we logically come up with some general principles that are consistent with, that match those observations. So let's go back to the traffic light uh, instance. So let's imagine that you see the posted signs for the speed limit. Okay, and you're a good driver, so you follow the speed limit and you begin to notice uh, that the lights are turning green as you approach them over and over and over. So from these repeated observations, you conclude, here's where you come up with a general principle, that the lights must be timed according to the speed limit. It's the only logical conclusion. And so you're beginning with specific observations. The light's turning green every time I approach the light at this constant speed. And you come up with this general conclusion. Well, the lights must be timed. So that's inductive reasoning. So after talking about or introducing deductive and inductive reasoning, your textbook uh, in section 1.6 goes into sort of a case study, an example of science in action. And there's thousands and thousands of examples they could use, but this is a pretty good, timely, important one having to do with an environmental issue that humanity was faced with. And um, anyway, in 1985, British scientist by the name of Joseph Farman, he discovered a 30% decrease in ozone in the upper atmosphere of the Earth after spending five years in the Antarctic where he was doing research. Now, ozone is a molecule. O3. It has three oxygen atoms that make it up, and it is in fact a form of oxygen gas. The oxygen that we breathe down here at ground level on Earth is O2, so that's oxygen. Now, the culprit was identified as chlorine, and the chlorine was coming from chemicals that were released into the atmosphere by uh, man-made um, chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. So chlorine naturally breaks down ozone, naturally breaks it down. So chemists knew this, uh, but it wasn't realized that these chlorofluorocarbons that were being released um, from say uh, refrigerants, um, other kinds of uh, chemicals were going up into the atmosphere and doing this. Nobody had thought about it. Now, once it was discovered, then worldwide global efforts uh, were put into action to decrease the amount of CFCs that were being produced and released. And in fact, we were able to decrease the production from 1.1 million tons per year in 1986 to just 200,000 tons per year after that. And uh, that was uh, accomplished through what's called the Kyoto Protocol in the late 80s. And it's a testament to what we can do when we uh, coordinate, and cooperate, and identify a big environmental um, problem and take action to solve it. So 
this is a good example of how we might tackle climate change today that is severely altering our Earth's climates and endangering humans. That we need, once again, a worldwide coordinated effort to seriously combat the problem of climate change because we know what's causing it. Anyway, since these actions were taken uh, with the chlorofluorocarbons, the ozone hole has been healing. So we are on our way to getting a repaired ozone layer, making us safer down here on the surface of the earth. Now, science in general is a process for uh, understanding the natural world. And so there are many ways to do science. It's pretty wide open, kind of depends on the kind of question you're asking as to just how you're going to investigate something. But we commonly uh, put together what's referred here in section 1.7 as the stages of a scientific investigation. Please understand that you don't have to follow every single one of these stages in order for it to be science. But this is a very typical process that scientists follow in investigating things. So biology is very dynamic, always changing, new ideas replacing old ones. And that's not unique to biology. All the sciences are like this. That's the nature of science is replacing older ideas with newer ideas when the evidence suggests that we should. So, for example, evolution has been accepted by biologists for well over 150 years now uh, to explain life's similarities and differences. And we've touched on that a little bit. We'll come back to that before this chapter ends. So we changed our point of view uh, about life on Earth as new evidence came forward. Uh, another example, germs like bacteria are a better explanation for why people get sick than what was thought of before germ theory in the 1800s, that there was some kind of mysterious force that were making people sick. So changed our ideas based on new evidence. So scientists systematically conduct experiments to evaluate hypotheses, answers or explanations that they've come up with about observed phenomena. And that's the nuts and bolts, the bread and butter of science, is evaluating or testing hypotheses, ideas, to figure out whether they're supported or whether we should reject them. And so, yeah, hypotheses that cannot be falsified or rejected. We make every attempt through experimentation to find evidence to reject a hypothesis, and we can't do it then those are the hypotheses that we tentatively accept as being true and work with them. Tentative, by the way, means um, uh, temporary, you know, could change. So if we say, hey, our Zoom meeting, our class meeting is going to start at 10 a.m. on Monday, but that's tentative. It means it could change. Ideas and science are always tentative. If new evidence comes along, we remain open to changing our ideas, our hypotheses. They are tentative. So like I said on the last slide, we don't have to follow this specific step-by-step -step process in order to be doing science. Uh, but this is a very typical approach and a very common approach that uh, some, uh, students learn when they're taking a biology class like this. So six stages, six stages is what you're uh, we're going over here. And the first one is observation. We have to begin with looking around and documenting what's going on. We might do it with our eyes. We might do it with our ears. We might do it with some kind of technology, like through a telescope or through a microscope. Um, there's all kinds of ways to make observations. And we can only observe natural phenomena. Supernatural phenomena are beyond our ability to detect. So that's hopeless to do that. So observations of natural phenomena. 
So let me give you an example. Let's imagine that you bake a cake. I bake a cake. I pull it out of the oven and it comes out flat as a pancake. It's supposed to come out nice and fluffy and tall, you know, cake-like, but it comes out flat. So that's an observation. The next step in the scientific process that's being outlined here is hypothesis. Let's come up with an answer or an explanation for what we're observing, you know, to make sense of our observations. So think of a hypothesis as a tentative answer or explanation for observed phenomena. Throw out the window the idea that a hypothesis is an educated guess. And the reason why I want you to throw that idea out the window is because when we come up with hypotheses, when we come up with answers or explanations, we're not guessing. Guessing isn't part of it. So yes, educated, but not a guess. Educated means we are basing our answers and explanations for what we're seeing on prior knowledge and experience, what we already know, what science already knows about. So that's what a hypothesis is, an answer or an explanation, a tentative one, based on prior knowledge and experience. And we want to come up with multiple hypotheses for something we've observed. So make sure we don't leave anything out because if we only come up with one hypothesis, it very well might be the wrong one. So scientists routinely go through the uh, process of coming up with alternative hypotheses. So for example, the cake came out of the oven flat as a pancake. So we want to come up with some hypotheses for why that might be. So we might ask the question, well, what makes cakes rise? Cakes rise because of, one hypothesis is, eggs. Maybe adding eggs is what makes a cake rise. Or maybe high temperature. Maybe it's got to be a high temperature above some point. Or maybe it's the baking powder in the uh, batter. Or, you know, we could keep coming up with alternative hypotheses. So probably only one or two of these is correct. And so we need to do some experiments to figure out what, which hypothesis can be supported and not rejected. But we have to logically spend some time coming up with alternatives before we come go to the next step. So moving on with our six step process of a scientific investigation, step number three, predictions. A prediction is an expected result or outcome, your book says consequence, under specific conditions. So like under the umbrella of an experiment that you're conducting. If a hypothesis is correct, then specific consequences can be expected under certain conditions. Example, if baking powder causes cakes to rise, so that's our hypothesis, that's a hypothesis that I'm going with here, it's the baking powder, and I add baking powder to the cake batter, then I would illogically expect if baking powder is what makes cakes rise, then the cake will rise. That's our expected consequence or outcome. This, by the way, is what kind of logic? We're going from a general answer, hypothesis, to a specific outcome or consequence. So this is deductive logic, if and then logic. So we devise this, we come up with this, all right? We put this down on paper, and now we gotta actually do the test. We've gotta do the experiment. So scientists conduct experiments in an attempt to falsify or reject hypotheses. That's why we do experiments. And a great deal of creativity becomes useful at this stage because there's no cookbook or recipe book that's telling us exactly how to devise an experiment or a task. We have to really think creatively uh, about this. So there's a lot of creativity and ingenuity and intuition in science. It's not all just a regimented step-by-step -step process.
So two more steps to our six step scientific process. Step number five is the establishment of controls when you're doing your experiment, controls. So experiments usually employ what your textbook is called a parallel design, where you're comparing two or more groups that are treated exactly the same, except for one condition, the one condition that you want to investigate or test. And that one condition that you are changing or varying between the groups you're testing, that one condition that's different between groups is called an independent variable. So the independent variable is the one thing that you are changing or manipulating in your experiment to see what happens. Scientists use a control group to assess the influence of the independent variable. So conditions stay the same in the, in the control group in comparison to what we call the experimental or variable group. So two or more groups are compared in an experiment and those two groups differ in the value of one variable, the one thing that you want to test. So let's go back to the cake baking example. And I think that baking powder causes cakes to rise. That's, that's what I think. Maybe my research team agrees with me. So we have set up this design of an experiment and using the if and then logic. And now we're bringing into this a control group and an experimental group. If baking powder causes cakes to rise, if that's indeed true, and I bake 10 cakes with baking powder and 10 cakes without baking powder. Okay, there's an experimental group and a control group. The control group has no baking powder and the experimental groups have baking powder. We want to see what baking powder does. Okay, so there's our parallel design. And otherwise, we want to keep all the other variables for these cakes the same, controlled. That means even though we're going to change the amount of baking powder, that's our independent variable. We want to say bake them for the same amount of time at the same temperature with all the other same ingredients, the same kinds of pans. We want all the other variables to be controlled, to be kept the same in our groups so that we can be confident that those variables aren't causing the groups to come out different in the results. It's only the one thing, the baking powder, that we're fiddling around with. If the cakes come out different in the end, it would have to be from the baking powder. It's logical. So we get to the then statement, the prediction, the expected result. Then the 10 cakes with baking powder will rise higher than the 10 cakes without baking powder. That's a logical expectation. Conclusion is our last step in this process. So after we gather some data, some results, and we've done an experiment, we've done a test, then what we do is we compare the results, the actual data, the results, to what we thought would happen, our prediction. And if they match, if the results match the prediction, then the hypothesis is supported and not rejected. If the results don't match the prediction, what we thought would happen, then we have a logical basis to reject the hypothesis and say that it, that's not the correct hypothesis, and we move on. So, for example, if we do the cake experiment, and we find that, yes, indeed, the 10 cakes with baking powder rose considerably more than the 10 cakes without baking powder, then that result matches our prediction. We predicted that that would be the case. And we, then we can conclude that our hypothesis that baking powder causes cakes to rise is supported and not rejected. So here's a figure out of your textbook, figure 1.7, that illustrates the scientific process. It shows the flow of how scientists conduct science. And again, this is one way 
that we do this, that we do science. It's not the only way. Um, but uh, if we're conducting experiments, like in the health sciences, then this would be a common approach to take. So number one, observation. Number two, alternative hypotheses. I'm emphasizing that here. Number three, coming up with your predictions, okay, in your experiment. So you run your experiment and you're either going to reject hypotheses or not reject. Okay, and you're going to go through your multiple alternative hypotheses and for each one, conduct an experiment and either your hypothesis will be rejected or supported based on whether your results match your predictions. And so in the end, after doing this with many different hypotheses and you might, you know, repeat experiments, conduct different experiments to help build confidence that a hypothesis is correct then we can get to some final conclusions. Let me bring in the cake baking example. So we do the experiment with baking powder and we find indeed the cakes with baking powder rose higher than the ones without. Next, we decide to bake 10 cakes with, um, let's say, um, sugar and 10 cakes without sugar. Okay, And then we add baking powder to all of them. Okay, so that would be a controlled variable, was all the cakes get baking powder. But in this experiment, we've got a control group with no sugar and an experimental group with sugar. We bake our cakes, we pull them out of the oven, and lo and behold, we find that uh, they all are, have risen. So it's not the sugar that makes them rise, because even cakes without sugar rose. So we can reject that hypothesis. Then we start baking the cakes in different shapes of pans. We do the same procedure. We have all the same ingredients and in all the cakes. It's just that we're pouring batter in different types of pans. We run the experiment. We bake the cakes. We pull them out of the oven. They all rise. Okay, so we can reject the hypothesis that the shape of the pan makes the cake rise. This is the process. This is the procedure where we go through and test alternative hypotheses to see which one is still standing. So here I embedded uh, a video on, on the slide and you should see an image a video on the scientific process, the scientific method and interpreting the graph. And near the bottom of this embedded uh, image and near the bottom of the slide, you should, if you move your cursor around, be able to detect the play button and uh, watch the video and answer some questions while you're watching the video on your worksheet. Uh, but uh, this is a good follow up to after listening to me talk about the process of science. So we have discussed the process of science. And again, emphasizing the point that there's not just one way to do science. Uh, let's say you're a person who likes to go discover fossils and see what kinds of life existed in, in Earth's past. Uh, well, you wouldn't be following a, a, an experimental protocol with control groups and experimental groups like I just described. In that kind of science, you're just going out to uh, some place on earth where you think there's the right kinds of rocks that fossils might exist and you start digging and looking and searching and maybe you discover something a new observation and you share that with the rest of the world you know you publish a paper about a new fossil you didn't have to do a controlled experiment there but you're doing science you're understanding our natural world so anyway i just want to make that point there are multiple ways to do science here we're switching gears and talking about theories and certainty. Theory and certainty. So what is a theory? We learn that word fairly early in our lives. Uh, theory means different things to different audiences. And what's important here is what theory means to scientists, because that's what we're talking about is science. To scientists, uh, theory represents potential certainty. Potential certainty could be wrong, could change. And a theory is a unifying explanation for a broad range of phenomena. 
broad range of observations. So theories are bigger and more powerful potentially than a hypothesis. Hypotheses are, are more pointed and specific. Let me give you an example. Uh, the theory of natural selection. We're going to get into that, I think, in a little more detail coming up here. So this is a theory. It's an explanation for how species get their adaptations, their special characteristics that match them to the environment. And it's called a theory because this explains how all life on Earth gets its adaptations. It doesn't matter if you're a bacterium or a human or a cactus. It's a powerful explanation that applies to all of life. That's what makes it a theory. Now, to the general public, theory often means uh, or implies a lack of knowledge or a guess. Like you might hear a politician say, oh, it's just a theory. That's a phrase that drives a scientist crazy because to say it's just a theory is to show that you don't understand what a theory is. Because some theories like natural selection or germ theory or the atomic theory in physics and chemistry are so well supported uh, and so powerful for explaining things that to say it's just a theory or to imply that it's just a guess is completely wrong, completely wrong. So to wrap up here, theory is a big, broad explanation for a wide range of phenomena. And whether the theory is correct or not depends on the evidence from doing experiments to support it or not. But if a theory is correct, if it is supported, it could potentially be a very powerful thing in science, a very powerful tool. Similar to hypotheses, uh, scientists accept a theory provisionally tentatively, basically the same thing. So there's always the possibility, possibility always remains that future evidence, maybe with new technology, new ways of testing, will lead us to revise or even reject a theory. That's the beauty of science, is that we're always standing to be corrected if new evidence comes along. That's why science changes so quickly, because we're always learning more and building and growing on what we know already. As an example, gene theory, gene theory, it once stated that each gene in our DNA has the genetic code or the instructions for making a specific protein. That was the original gene theory. And it turns out it's not totally wrong. But we now know that some genes code for molecules called RNA, not proteins. So we revise the theory a little bit with new knowledge to say genes have the genetic instructions for, for making protein molecules or RNA molecules. So we just tweak the theory a little bit when new evidence came along. A final point on this slide is that the process of science is not just trial and error, just let's flip this switch, let's flip that switch, see what happens, see what happens, but it involves a lot of judgment and a lot of intuition, uh, things that humans uh, can do very well. So, by the way, what roles do you think judgment and intuition play in science? Can you Think of some examples. So I told you a few slides back, uh, I think I did. This is a big topic. To talk about science is not a simple thing. There's a lot of ideas to be grasped and to be understood and to be incorporated into your thinking. So the new one here, in section 1.8 is that science has inherent limitations. We're limited. Now, one of them is that we can only discover natural phenomena through observation and measurement. It is impossible to observe and discover supernatural phenomena. The very word supernatural means beyond the natural. It's not 
part of our physical material universe. So if the supernatural does exist, we're not going to be able to know about it through science. It's logically impossible. So supernatural and religious phenomena, while they may be true, are beyond the scope of science. So we can't know if they're true using the tools of science. Those can only be accepted upon faith. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're just drawing the distinction of what science can and can't do. So that's one of the limits, is that we are bound by uh, discovering and observing natural phenomena. There's also practical limits, like uh, we can't rely upon science to solve all of our problems, so that's unreasonable. And also our abilities to test certain ideas may be limited by technology. There are many cases over the past couple hundred years where scientists may have come up with a hypothesis or theory, but they weren't able to test it until the technology came along to do that. So, but as new technologies come along, then we can have new breakthroughs. So for example, satellites that we send up into orbit going around the earth are able to observe and detect things that we never could do, but with our feet down on the ground here. So once that technology came into being, satellites allowed us to test and investigate uh, whole new areas of the natural world that we couldn't do before. So relies on technology. So we're going to end this chapter uh, by reviewing four theories that unify biology as a science. Four theories that broad general explanations of ideas and principles that get to the core of what biology is all about. To explain life using these different theories. So we just talked about theory a couple slides ago. These, these big unifying ideas that explain a broad range of observations. So keep that in mind as we go over these four theories, because that's what they're doing. They're explaining a mountain of observations to make sense of them, coming up with a, some unifying principles. So cell theory, gene theory, the theory of heredity, the theory of evolution. These are the four biggies. So let's begin with cell theory. So what cell, well, cell theory uh, came up in the 1800s, around 1850. Well, cells were first reported as being discovered looking through a microscope in the 1600s. So it took well over 200 years for biologists to get to the point of uh, coming up with cell theory. It took quite a while. And these are the basic principles, these three bullets on the slide of cell theory. All organisms are composed, are made up of at least one cell. So by the time 1850-ish rolled around, biologists had made so many observations of different living things on Earth, and time and time again, they found that these living things were always made up of at least one cell. This is an example of inductive reasoning, by the way. Observation after observation after observation led to this general principle that still holds solid today. The other principle of cell theory is the cell is the most basic unit of life. So that's to say that life's processes happen in the cell. And even for organisms like us, humans that are made up of trillions of cells, the individual cells in our bodies are where life processes are taking place. They are the basic units of life. And the third principle of cell theory, and again, this is based on repeated observations from lots of different kinds of organisms, so inductive logic. All cells come from pre-existing cells. So see the figure below. I'm showing you a sperm cell, fertilizing an egg cell, 
those cells came from pre-existing cells in a male and in a female. And when the sperm combines with the egg, we get a fertilized egg called a zygote, and there's a new cell. That cell came from pre-existing cells. Now that zygote uh, begins to divide, begins to multiply and make more cells. So that embryo is a ball of cells and each cell has its own DNA. Those cells came from the pre-existing cell. And eventually we get a newborn baby and a baby crawling around and all the cells in that baby's body came from pre-existing cells. That's the idea. That's the concept. So cells have been giving rise to new cells for as long as life has been around on Earth, which is over three and a half billion years. Now, in an upcoming chapter, we're going to learn a lot more about cells, different kinds of cells. <coughs> Excuse me. So the figure on the right hand side of the slide is showing you what's called a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. Uh, that's like what bacteria have and what we have as animals is eukaryotic. And we'll get to that shortly. So next we're going to look at gene theory, another big unifying principle for all of biology. Genetic information is encoded in molecules of DNA. DNA is uh, an acronym for the actual name of the molecule, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. That's DNA. So universally in life, bacteria, funguses, plants, animals, genetic information is encoded in DNA. And genes are uh, different segments of DNA, just like a cookbook has different recipes in it, different pages, different segments with different recipes. So a gene is basically a segment of DNA that has a recipe that has specific instructions for making a protein or an RNA. So that's what a gene is. This is part of gene theory. They're in the DNA and they have the specific instructions for making these kinds of molecules. And the proteins and the RNA that's encoded by an organism's genes that are made using an organism's genes, uh, those molecules, the proteins and the RNA, determine what the organism's going to be like in terms of its form and in terms of how it works. So the basis of this gene theory, again, is that the information for making the molecules of organisms and building organisms, the information is found in the genes of DNA. As an example, in your eyes, the image, the figure that I have here on your slide, uh, lens cells in your eyes are tightly packed with transparent proteins called crystalline and they help your eyes to see. You have a gene in your DNA. I have the gene in my DNA, the instructions, that the uh, gene is used to make this protein called crystalline. So there is one example of how gene theory uh, is being put to use. And we're going to learn how the instructions in our DNA are used to make proteins. It's a pretty fundamental and important part of our biology. And we'll look at that in a future chapter through the process of what's called transcription, where the instructions in your DNA are copied, and translation, where those copied instructions are used to make a protein. So we're going to go through the nitty gritty of that later. This is just pointing out to you what gene theory is, one of the four biggie theories in biology. Now, figure 1.12 in your textbook uh, is showing you sort of how gene theory works. We're applying gene theory to us humans and uh, giving you a better picture of what's going on in us. So, for example, the human body, your body, might contain up to a hundred trillion cells. And each cell in your body contains all 46 chromosomes.
that you got from your mom and your dad. And those chromosomes contain your DNA. That's where your DNA is found. It's in these things called chromosomes. Each chromosome has hundreds to thousands of genes. So each chromosome is kind of like a cookbook. And you got a whole set of cookbooks. You got 46 of them. And each one of these cookbooks has hundreds to thousands of recipes in it, genes in it. And those genes spread along the DNA in your chromosomes have the instructions, again, for making RNA and proteins. These genes are made up of smaller molecules called nucleotides. I wouldn't worry about that too much right now. We'll look at this in an upcoming chapter. You know, it's just a bunch of words. It starts to get to be a tangled mass. But it's the order of these nucleotides, just like the order of letters in the words that you're reading on this slide. The order of those nucleotides uh, determine the genetic instructions. We'll look at it later. A final point, point number five on this slide, really important for you to, to uh, learn, is that all the cells in your body or all the cells in my body contain the same DNA. We got that DNA from our mom and our dad, and then our cell started dividing and multiplying and making more cells. So every single cell from head to toe in my body has the same DNA. But we make different kinds of cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, other kinds of cells, by turning on or turning off different genes in our DNA, by turning on or turning off different recipes, and thereby making different kinds of cells. It's an incredible process, and it's something that takes some time to fully uh, understand and that's what we're going to be doing in biology, this class and uh, onward. As, if, as long as you keep going. So here's the third of four theories that we're talking about that are the big unifying theories of biology. And this is the theory of heredity, heredity. So the theory of heredity says that genes are passed down generations or across generations as discrete units. You know, we're passing on little packages of instructions to our children, to our offspring. We're inheriting them. So heredity, new concept. Mendel's theory of heredity, we'll see this in chapter 10, no worries, gave rise to the field of genetics. So this was well over 100 years ago. Actually, Mendel figured out the rules of heredity. Uh, about 150, 60, about 170, 60 years ago, long time ago. The chromosomal theory of inheritance states that genes are located on chromosomes, and those chromosomes are passed from parents to offspring. So chromosome theory is kind of inside the theory of heredity. So the last theory that we're going to cover that unifies biology is the theory of evolution. And before we get there, we're going to talk about the three domains of life, sort of an introduction to this. So all living organisms on Earth are related to one another in a common tree of descent we call in biology the tree of life. And we drew the conclusion that we're all related to each other because all life on Earth shares similarities to one another, like a similar genetic code based in DNA, that uh, the simplest explanation is that we all came from the same starting point billions of years ago when life got started. We're all related to each other. And in this view of this tree of life, of genetic relationships, uh, the six kingdoms that you were introduced to earlier are grouped into bigger groups called three domains. The domains are the biggest groupings of life. So check out the figure on your slide. One domain is the bacteria. So that's one big major lineage of life with millions of species of bacteria. That one big lineage of life is uh, a domain. <clears throat> Another major domain is the archaea. 
and the archaea is a little more closely related to us, eukarya, than the bacteria are. You can see that in the diagram because the archaea branch is more closely connected to the eukarya branch. The third domain is the eukarya, and we are part of that domain. We are animals, and you can see in the diagram that animals are inside that domain. So are plants, so are fungi, and so are protists. So the theory of evolution explains the unity, means the similarities of all life forms, and the diversity of life, the different kinds of life. So that's what the theory of evolution does for us. Uh, so let's take a closer look at this, okay? So this was just telling you about these three domains and introducing to you this tree of life to show you how uh, they're related to each other. So here we have the theory of evolution. Okay, uh, Evolution is defined as these three words, descent with modification. So it's important to understand what these three words mean and have a picture in your head of what this phrase is telling you. The next slide, I'm going to uh, try to break it down for you a little more carefully. But uh, this is how biologists define evolution uh, very succinctly, is descent with modification. I don't have it here on the slide, but if we were to sort of state the theory of evolution as Charles Darwin uh, came up with, it would be that all life on Earth is related to each other through the process of descent. We are all descendants from past earlier ancestors. So that part of the theory of evolution is saying that we're all connected together by common ancestors on Earth. And that the diversity of life, the different kinds of life, are a result of this process called natural selection. Natural selection is what gives rise to different adaptations of different species. So all life is related, and the differences that we see in life forms is because of natural selection. That would be sort of the long-winded um, definition of evolution. Now, let's look at natural selection. Natural selection, organisms that are best able to respond to the challenges of living. Organisms that are best matched to their environment. It's another way to put it. They're going to leave the most offspring. They're going to reproduce the most successfully. And by doing that, they're going to pass on their genetics, their genes that help them to be successful. They're going to pass them on to their offspring through their chromosomes. Inheritance. And the most beneficial traits that we see in a population, the traits that are best matched to the environment, those are what we call adaptations. So adaptations are features or characteristics of organisms, living things, that match them to their environment, help them to survive and reproduce. Natural selection results in adaptations. So here's a figure I put together to try to explain and show uh, what descent with modification means. Descent with modification is evolution. So a population of organisms gives rise to subsequent generations by reproducing. You and I are, well, I'm part of a generation from the late 60s. You're probably, um, you know, you're a more recent generation. But, uh, you know, at least in my family lineage, I'm part of a generation. My parents are part of a generation. My grandparents are the generation before that. So those are generations. And so a population of organisms gives rise to sequential generations that are genetically different from the starting point. If that happens, then there has been descent with modification. So look in this diagram and start in the bottom left corner. Each circle represents an individual organism, like a lizard. And so a whole group of those similarly colored yellow circles would be a population of 
lizards, for example, living in a field. Now look at the blue arrow. The lizards reproduce and they give birth to descendants, to their offspring. So that's the process of descent, of producing offspring. Now imagine in that uh, next generation, which is in the middle of the, the slide, uh, most of the lizards that are born are yellow, but there's a green one. Where did that green one come from? Well, that's a result of mutation. There was a mutation in the DNA of one of the parents, and that mutation was passed on to an offspring, and it makes the offspring green. Well, now the population is genetically modified. It's genetically different from our starting point, because now there's a, an altered gene to make a lizard green. So the population has evolved already, just from going from the bottom corner to the middle. Now imagine that that green lizard is matched to the environment better than the yellow lizards, like these lizards are living in a grassy meadow or something. So the green lizard blends in and it's able to survive and reproduce. The yellow lizards, some of them survive, but many of them get eaten from, by predators because they don't blend in as well. So the green one reproduces and look in the top right hand corner of the slide. There's a whole bunch of green lizards now. And so there's descent with modification. There's been a new generation now produced. There's been descendants produced and they are genetically modified. They are genetically different from the prior generation. This is illustrating descent with modification and the, the, the gradual changes that occur from one generation to the next lead up to, or can lead up to big changes over long periods of time. Now here I'm using a figure out of your textbook. Figure 1.15, the theory of evolution. And it's talking about these uh, different species of birds called finches that live on the Galapagos Islands, uh, west of South America, west of Ecuador, near the equator. And these are famous birds that Charles Darwin first collected and described when he sailed around the world in the 1800s. And the birds, the finch species, have different shapes of beak and different shapes of beaks are adaptations for eating different kinds of food. So how do these birds get their differently shaped beaks? Well, biologists using modern technology have been able to identify the specific genes that make the beaks thicker or longer. One gene called BMP4 controls how thick a beak is. Another gene called calmodulin controls how long the beak is. So it ends up becoming not too difficult to get different species of finches with differently shaped beaks by these genes being expressed a little bit differently. So if in one species the BMP4 gene is being expressed more, then the, those birds will have a thicker beak. In another species, if uh, the calmodulin gene is expressed more, then the birds will have a longer beak. So we're able to get to the nitty gritty genetics of how these different species acquired their adaptations by looking at their genetics. It's a tool that we didn't have even just a couple decades ago. Now, artificial selection is, is important and useful to uh, point out to you and explain to you. Artificial selection is when humans choose which organisms are going to reproduce and pass on their genes. It's not just let up to, left up to nature to figure out who's going to reproduce and who isn't, but humans are making the choice. And because of this, of humans deciding which organisms are going to reproduce and pass on their genetics, we have caused thousands of different types of plants and animals to evolve, to change over hundreds or even thousands of years. We've gotten different kinds of dogs, different varieties of cats, different varieties of sheep, of goats, of cows, of different plants, all through artificial selection. We have caused these things to evolve 
over a relatively short period of time. So for example, these vegetables that you may or may not eat, like broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, they all come from an original ancestor, which was wild mustard. And humans thousands of years ago were collecting, you know, little flowers, clusters of flowers off of wild mustard and eating them, feeding their kids. They're edible, they're nutritious, they're healthy. And so if there was a plant growing that had a bigger cluster of flowers, then we learned that we could plant the seeds from that plant and then have a new generation that just has plants with bigger clusters of flowers. And we kept doing that generation after generation, and we get broccoli. The same thing with uh, how we get these other vegetable varieties by selecting organisms, wild mustards, with certain traits and going, oh, well, I'm going to plant seeds from, from this mustard plant because it has more leaves, you know, cabbage that I can eat, etc. So artificial selection is something that humans have done, have humans have caused, uh, but it's basically natural selection just with a human choice thrown. So here's the last slide of our part two. This uh, whole recording ends up being about an hour, which would be as long as I'd probably lecture if we were in a classroom, probably even longer with a little bit of discussion thrown in. Uh, but that's what we can do with a Zoom meeting is talk about these topics and have you work on them. But here is an embedded video from your textbook um, explaining genetic variation, the basis of natural selection. So I've got some questions for you to answer about this. Again, near the bottom of the slide, there should be, if you move your uh, cursor around, a little play button, a triangle where you can watch the video. If this doesn't work in the YouTube video that you're watching, then I have posted the PowerPoint in your Canvas module, the original PowerPoint. And on that PowerPoint, the, the um, uh, slide would work to play the video. So you can find it there if this doesn't work.